So my testimony, I'll try to make this short and sweet and keep it to 10 minutes. Um, this is going to be about how I came to salvation. And uh, yeah. So my story seems most similar to the older brother who wouldn't rejoin the the party that's happening for the prodigal son's return in the story where Luke 15, 28, 32 says, but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my uh, friends. But as soon as his son, as your son, <laughs> sorry, but as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots you killed the fatted calf for him and he said to him son you are always with me and all that i have is yours it was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and he and was lost and is found so how that relates to my life is that my life has been a roller coaster where I constantly get frustrated when pursuing God, but God is merciful to a fool like myself and always calls me back gently to himself. Uh, each time allowing me and God slowly walk closer and closer together, reminding me that he keeps telling me all in a way, all that I have is yours, like the father does in this parable. So, switching up to uh, the next bit, I sir, it all started with a nightmare, which is kind of crazy to think about. When I was really young, probably like six years old, I uh, had a nightmare of basically this dog made, made out of gears, mechanical parts, chasing me, and I could not sleep. It was during like Christmas vacation and all that. And so I had heard during my Sunday classes, because I had grown up Christian, hey, you, there's this thing called prayer. I should ask my dad, like any good person, to just, you know, pray for me and pray for this nightmare to go away. But unbeknownst to me, what ended up happening uh, was he misinterpreted my request as a prayer for salvation that you know i i was wanting to pray this in his prayer with him and repeat after him and all of that i being so scared of this nightmare at six years old was realized that i was praying the prayer of salvation but went along with it because i was like if i, I need to be saved to be get out of this nightmare so be it so i went along with uh did the whole repeat after me sinner's prayer and after that surprisingly i slept perfectly that night so most people would say that's a cute story but that's not necessarily like in some hard legalistic christians would christians would say you didn't really come to salvation you're too young you came for the wrong reasons you didn't actually decide to pursue god as your lord and savior and s decide to have him decide the rest of your life. And so that's is where I get to walk through all these different moments that slowly change my perspective to be have a heart after God. The first moment was I really wanted Lego Rock Raiders. So I made a you know the typical deal. Hey God. And this was a little video game that you could buy on CD. I asked him if you are real Give me this old video game, and I will pray to you every day of my life. Because I thought that was a simple thing to be for me to be able to do, and I really wanted this game, and I also wanted to see if God was real. The game at that point had been pretty much out of CD print for a while, and but lo and behold, at my dad's favorite store, Fry's Electronics, Lego decided to resell the classics as a collection. And my dad ended up getting the Lego Rock Raiders from, uh, video game from that set. So from that point, I only prayed consistently for a week, which is really embarrassing to say. And this is like probably like eight or ten. And I really learned how incapable I am of just keeping my word. In, in retrospect, a sinner, 
Uh, but at that point, I had this knowledge that, to me, God existed. So after playing a few real-time strategy games like Star Trek Armada 2 and StarCraft 1 at the time, I realized that the early game is more important than the late game because it defines what you have in the late game to win with. So I applied that to my life and decided now if I wanted to pursue God, you know, like my parents, or to look elsewhere for my for, for my fulfillment. And un, unknowingly, I ended up approaching the problem similar to game theory, asking what do I lose if choosing God is wrong, and what do I gain if choosing God is right? Kind of scenario. Uh, so, what do I? If God is wrong, what do I lose? I, I can't do whatever I want to do on this earth. Uh, there's still a lot of video games I can play, but they, you know I can't commit adultery. I can't just lie to get whatever I want. I'll need to follow the Ten Commandments. I can't murder people, you know? I, I will... I cannot lie, uh, which was a big one for me. And so, another thing is it will be challenging to keep a good character. I'll need to study up on how to do that. I'll need to be disciplined and self-disciplined to do that. But what do I gain? Uh, if it's right that God exists and that God is has a heaven... I get to have eternity, and the, I'll also gain a good character along the way of being a Christian, which it can be something enticing to employers sometimes to have it hire someone of integrity, but also uh, very valuable among friends. So I ended up choosing to decide to follow God. Now, some of you may ask, and uh, this is more of a tangent for my notes, was I thinking about other religions at that time? Like, was there, you know, my parents were Christians, obviously, but, but did I think about, like, Muslims or Mormons? I didn't have any friends of those religions at the time, really, uh, uh, but I did think about that, and I was thinking, okay, my, since God answered my Lego Rock Raiders prayer, and also helped out with a nightmare scenario, when I prayed the saving uh, the sinner's prayer with my dad, I'm going to start here with Christianity and see where it takes me. And if I end up finding out that things are different, then I would look elsewhere. But luckily, that never. I as I kept pursuing, things kept getting better. So. Yeah. So at this point, I decided to casually follow God whenever I get the chance. Skip forward to freshman year of high school. Uh, I went to this big old conference called Acquire the Fire, where they put a bunch of teenagers in a giant stadium and put some big name preachers and big name worship leaders to be able to lead worship. And I guess I'm on track for finishing 15 minutes from now, so I'm going to be speed this up. And I prayed that God would not embarrass me. My dad went to the bathroom just before the, what I'll call the experience of the Holy Spirit falling upon the stadium of teens. We ended up singing the song with everything for 45 minutes straight, skipping the planned sermon because of how much everyone, all of my friends, all of a sudden became so at peace, but also deeply aware of our sin. Whether that was pornography for some, whether that was lying for some, whether that was, you know, just cheat, stealing test results, you know, it was kind of crazy. And people were crying and people were getting prayer for and it was all. And that was the moment to me because I closed my eyes and plugged my ears to not be involved in this quote unquote hallucination because I was concerned about mass hallucinations at the time. And I still felt that peace and I still felt that awareness of my sin. And that was really, really the moment that God became real to me. This is not some fake hallucination. This is not some Christmas story, you know, told over and over again, and people just trying to force themselves to believe that that God is real uh, as a, a sense to bring peace to yourself. So at that point, 
I read secretly every day, beginning from Genesis till Joshua, um, the Bible for myself. Now, I end up giving up a Joshua because I got tired of Leviticus, which has a bunch of rules of how to sacrifice animals for the Israelites. And going into Joshua, I'm like, I don't care about these old battles. I want to know how to live my life now for God. So I ended up giving up, and it showed my incapability again. But I was very blessed that in Genesis, when I read about how Enoch walked with God for 300 years and was taken up by God, that became my desire. I hoped I could walk with God three times closer than Enoch so that in my lifetime I could be taken up with him. Uh, I even worked at a life extension company in hopes to extend my life long enough to walk with God like that, realizing that I probably couldn't walk three times closer to God as Enoch did. So that was kind of humorous that I did that IT work for a while. Growing up in the Assemblies of God, I heard a lot about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the next year was the Equip Conference that I was like, you know what? If the Choir of the Fire Conference, I could experience the Holy Spirit fall. Maybe I can experience it again in this Equip Conference. I went and prayed that God would baptize me even to the point of being embarrassed. I offered that to God this time, unlike with the Aquarium or Choir of the Fire. And I even prepared for the conference by watching some video commentaries on the Bible. During worship, I ended up feeling a tingling sensation on my skin, which the speaker said is one of the many ways people feel the Holy Spirit's presence sometimes. And I remembered, wait, I experienced the same tingling sensation when I worshipped as a kid, as a young little kid. And so I got really excited I ran out of my aisle um, and went to the front uh, where people were, you know, the prayer team members were praying for people. And I started just laying my hands on people and saying yes and amen, as if I had been anointed. And by laying my hands on people, that the prayers would get answered all the greater. Little did I know when I returned to my group, the sports person uh, in my youth group said, hey, Dude, you need to calm down. You're you're hyperventilating. I can tell you that you're breathing too fast right now. And that was devastating. Um, I ended up testing it later with uh, non-Christian songs. I find out that if I sing intensely for around 30 minutes, I can get that tingling sensation in my face due to hyperventilation. And that was so devastating to me that I decided to stop pursuing God out of spite against him. Like, why would he... I'm fine with being embarrassed for his sake, for the anointing, for the favor of God. But that realization that I just got embarrassed because of my own folly, of my own realization of my physical limitations, of taking a feeling at face value. And this is just my story, you know. Uh, This isn't, you'll have to interpret it for your own ends, but... You know, I still personally believe in the spiritual gifts, and I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And to clarify, I think there's three states that the Holy Spirit can be with you. You know, there's before you are saved, the Holy Spirit is with you, encouraging you to come to Christ. There's the second state of the Holy Spirit being in you once you come to salvation. And then there's this third state, the Holy Spirit can come upon a person. That upon experience is what a lot of people talk about when when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you want more answers to that kind of in specifics, I would highly recommend talking to Biznik, who will be teaching in Rec Room next week, uh, 1 Corinthians. But yeah, continuing my story. It was so devastating that I stopped pursuing God out of spite against him embarrassing me so badly. And I found my satisfaction in playing video games like Team Fortress 2 all the way to the end of high school. I still went to church. um, And in my Christian high school club, I asked a really hard question of my friends. How can you love something you hate? Because at that time, I hated God for what he had done to me. The church hurt, as some people will phrase it. And the poor example I gave was broccoli, where someone can dump ranch on it, symbolic of churches that play more video games and hide the scripture under the neath. 
Uh, you can try to cook it, steamed, slow cooked it, fry it, and other th ways. And that would be symbolic of taking the Bible academically, or maybe you can look at it emotionally, or storytelling, or conversationally, or debates, or apologetics. But in the end, the person will still not like the broccoli, you know? Um, and that's what, kind of what I found depend on all the different ways I kept pursuing God at that time. I'm trying to give God a second chance after that. The helpful answer I got was a candle will be lit if a fire is placed next to it. In the same way, your desire will grow as you ingest the word. It can be slow, it can be fast, but the more you're exposed to it, the better, the more chance that your desire will grow and you will stop hating the thing. That was a very interesting analogy. And I actually kind of found some scriptural idea behind it with Matthew 6, 19, 23, where it talks about what you look at, what you spend time with, what you, uh, what you treasure um, is going to be end up what you desire. So Matthew 6, 19 through 23, I'll go ahead and read. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye of... is ugh. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So that's really cool to see that there's some scriptural basis for where you tre put your treasure and where you direct your eye, that's where your desire will be. And so over time, as I continue to put my eye in the word, and put my and start putting more treasure in it in a sense you know hanging out in more christian community is the more my desire grew now fast forwarding to just before college it must have been a miracle between a really good technology career school and a christian university i ended up choosing the christian university with the reasoning i will have a better character and people will care more about good good character than good skills and work environments. That ended up backfiring on me later where after I graduated from college, I spent three years looking for work and couldn't find it because of many reasons. But I wonder if going to a more career-centric university would have helped. It took until my last semester to re for me to realize that I should be pursuing God seriously because I know that he exists from the Acquire Fire experience the Christian university is going to be my best hope to actually hear him, talk to him, walk with him. Since my last semester was only 12 credits, and usually I took 18 credit semesters, I treated pursuing God like a four-credit class, spending two, two, uh, two separate two-hour sessions combining everything I had tried in the past. 30 minutes of worship, 30 minutes of reading the Bible, 30 minutes of going through my prayer list, and 30 minutes of listening for God's voice, because I didn't want to rely solely on my professors for my theology. I wanted to be taught by God, you know, um, and I wanted clarification by that. Over the months, I noticed a sense of peace would come upon me. I noticed how much God's love exists throughout the Bible. I noticed how many questions I had and how thankful I was for the little things on a daily basis God seemingly orchestrated for me. And that's a miracle. I can't believe that God has so much mercy and grace to wait for me till the end of college after having so much experience in the church before then to be able to actually sit down with him like this. Now, anytime I can sit down for two hours to spend with God and I can be at peace with him because I trust him for my eternity. And that's insane. So this is how my walk with God really began. There is a much more to God's story in my life as the graduation day approaches. 
Um, but this is already way too long of a testimony. I hope you feel like you got to know me a bit better and can be reassured that pursuing God is a roller coaster of sacrifices, frustrations, learning, and then eventually growing in faith, hope, peace, and love. And that's quite the... I'm very honored to be able to share this testimony and story of how God, even with a stubborn fool like myself, who got frustrated with God, who decided to stop pursuing him because of one moment of one church hurt, um, still reached out to me and still sat down with me when I gave him the time to meet with me. So yeah, uh, uh, we're going to go ahead for the activity today. We're going to be going to an old map of the VR MMO church campus uh, way back when they were in alt space VR because I can... It's easier for me to upload the Proverbs scripture verses there. And we'll be walking through Proverbs 1, like I did in the rec room service during the volunteer fair. So I'm going to go ahead, give me literally one minute of patience, because I need to make that my other app account walk through those doors. <laughs> and so I'll... Uh, and it's going to be a Friends Plus instance. Once again, that reminder to friend someone in the space so that you can get into the space. And I'll just be dropping a portal in the back of space. Thank y'all. Thank you, Chatter. We are all here to praise my nigga Jesus. There's a cat on the floor. <laughs> hey, kitty cat. Want to step on you? It's not green. He's, it says it's, the cat's green, but he ain't green. My cat. Oh, big there you go. Now oh, you're talking. Going? <laughs> this cat you okay. made looks pretty good. Yeah. Face moves when he twists. <laughs> That's funny. Shutters is a great guy. I'm feeling a little better, Ellis. Um, still a little bit rough today. <laughs> oh, wow. This does look like alt space. Uh, I should be able to be heard by everyone. And here is Proverbs 1. New King James Version. Exciting, right? I'm sure Sentinel 1 and Mr. Pete and Chapter Green are excited to be back in the space. I'll give a few more seconds for anyone to walk over. While I pull up my notes. I can't see. Uh, yeah, That's I don't know if here. Cheddar's ported this all by himself, or if, if uh, Alice maybe have may have helped. That's so much here. Not sure, or at least grabbing. Okay. I think what we'll do is we'll do the first three verses, and then I'll go ahead and switch over to talking some more contacts about the Bible or about the book Proverbs. So Proverbs one, New King James Version. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, and to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. So what's exciting about that 
is you get to, as you can tell from the context, this is a book on how to live. There are illustrations throughout the Bible on how we should be digesting scripture, like chewing the cud, like animals. Um, and you know how cows have like mini stomachs in them where they have to process the grass multiple times to be able to fully digest it? In the same way, we need to be treating scripture like this, it, uh, processing it multiple times. So proverb in the Hebrew is a parable, a comparison, an a uh, aphorism, sentences of ethical wisdom, and ethical maxims. These short sentences that are in pa uh, uh, proverbs are really good because they're pulled from long experiences. They're easy to remember, and they are able to condense much wisdom into a small space. So just as much as when you take a file and zip it on a computer to be able to compress the data into a small form factor to download it, in the same way, these parables are a way of Done did it again. Oh. They done did it again. Again? Oh, no. <laughs> he froze? Yep, he crashed. I hope Cheddar's didn't pick it, kick his power strip again. <laughs> I, I wonder if he did this for the second time. Probably kick the power strip again. <laughs> I'll give him another moment. I feel like I should be able to, you know, yep, there you draw go. something on his face here while he's uh, frozen up. But... <laughs> We'll let him come back in. Oh, he's coming. He's like, he's back already. Maybe. You saw the message that he joined the instance. Here he comes running in. Maybe. Oh, and he's gone again. So yeah, this looks a lot like uh, the alt space room. Um, here in VR chat, it doesn't seem quite as high fidelity. I don't know if uh, you know maybe it had to cut down the textures or something like that. But it's, it's definitely not as sharp as it is in alt space, or was in alt space. Uh, but this, this is this is what it looked like. <laughs> Very. Uh, Hi, Mr. Pete. Cheddar's got disconnected. Uh, yeah, it looks like he got disconnected. Hopefully he'll be back shortly. He was disconnected, then he joined for a second again, and then it was out again. So uh, who knows? Yeah, there's, there's something to see this. Wow, does it bring back memories? It does. This is this is camp trip save down, a trip down memory lane. Uh, won't let me save it in favorites or anything. Yeah, I think it's probably part of the community labs or something. So I don't know if you can save it or not. Maybe right. That's what it is. Probably something like that. See, again, Alice is telling me that Cheddar's did all this. I guess she, she maybe showed him how, but, uh... <laughs> Hello. Hey. Oh. Can you hear me across the space? I yep. can hear Cheddar's. Yep. I don't know where Cheddar's is, but I hear... He's coming around the corner. <laughs> okay. Thank you back. so much for your patience. <laughs> So, so sorry, 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 sorry. I'm going to rearrange my power strip so I don't accidentally kick it and mess with everything. Usually it doesn't do this. <laughs> so where did I leave off? Uh, I was talking about how these compress a lot of wisdom into small sentences. You'll find that if you 
you ask a, a theology student to explain any of these parables that we're going to be reading or any of these short statements, that they end up expanding them into about an essay worth. And I think that's really cool to think of it in a very computational sense because you know, God not only wanted to give us wisdom, but did it in such a way so that we would only have to ingest a small amount and we could take it at our own pace. So God's good, God's amazing, and all of that. Um, I'll have a lot more to say about that. The general uh, wording throughout the Proverbs is he's referring to my son. So it's almost, you know, written 15 different times. And so it's almost like he's try Solomon, who was the writer of this book, one of the wisest people on this earth, uh, was writing it for his son uh, to so that he may learn from the mistakes Solomon made, you know? So I'm going to go ahead and continue on to verses 4, 5, and 6 because we need to keep a move on. To give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. So, what's cool about this little segment is it starts, it's telling us the purpose of Proverbs to, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquire, acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, for giving prudence to the simple, and for understanding Proverbs, parables, sayings, and riddles of the wise. Now, you'll notice when we continue on, there, you know, wisdom is the first thing that God created, according to some scholars, uh, when you're reading Genesis 4 and some stuff like that. The traditional belief of what wisdom is about is it's a, the ability to use knowledge in the right way. The biblical definition um, defines two different categories. There is the wisdom of this world, as we've talked about, on 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, and James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, if you want to look into that. And then there's the divine wisdom that's from above. Jesus Christ ends up being the wisdom of God. And you'll see in like Proverbs 8, 22, verse, verses 22 through 31, and 1 Corinthians 1, cha uh, chapter 1, verse 24 and verse 30, as well as Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. Wisdom occurs uh, 45 times in Proverbs, at least in the King James Version. And, you know, it's about being, you know, we need to be knowledgeable, experienced, and, ef and efficient in different areas of expertise to be able to use wisdom well. Because without, if you have a bunch of wisdom, but not the knowledge of what the current circumstances are, you're not going to be able to use your wisdom well. Uh, yeah. Do -do -do. You'll notice that in Proverbs 9, verse 10, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so, to be wise in a biblical sense... One must begin with a proper relationship to God. So wisdom means so much more. If we want to live wisely, we must begin with a commitment to Jesus Christ, who is the wisdom of God, as quoted in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Wisdom is described as eternal in Proverbs 8.22, uh, verses 22 and uh, 26. It's also described as the creator of all things in Proverbs 8, verses 27 and 29, and it's also the beloved of God in Proverbs 8, 30 through 31. So to yield your life to Christ and obey him is truism, as talked about in John 1, verses 1 and 2, and Colossians. 1 verses 15 through 19. So lots of little bits, but we'll continue reading here from, let's see. I'll just continue reading straight up. I think I'll do this section. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And, and so I got a little ahead of myself. Where you can see here, it says that. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. So I, I want to clarify. There, do Hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. There are some parents who are going to be, you know, not the best parents. They, not everything that a parent will, gives in instruction is going to be wise. But because parents love their children, just naturally, either from the biology of it or from the intentionality of it, you'll find that they will give you wisdom from the experiences they've gone through. Oftentimes, because we end up becoming very similar in some aspects to our parents, we the lessons they learned when growing up will also apply to us when we're growing up. The struggles they had when growing up may be the same struggles we go through to some degree when growing up. And so that's what I, one aspect of of why this is talking about we should hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. For there will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. So graceful. Great mercy is about, you know, not giving the punishment you deserve, where grace is giving you rewards and benefits that you didn't deserve. And so in this case, when you obey the instructions of your parents, you know, they are going to be a grace. You are going to get rewards and benefits that are everything, that are way above what you uh, deserve because you end up following the wisdom of other people who made the same mistakes before you. So we'll continue on to my son. If sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, and whole like those who go down to the pit. Ah, we shall, I'm going to keep going, because this kind of points to it. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son. Do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. So we're going to talk about how, A, murder is bad. I don't think I need to expound upon that. This was written way before, uh, pretty, like, you know, during Solomon's time when the Ten Commandments did exist and also talked about how the Israelites shouldn't mur murder. But this is, not murdering is something that applies to all cultures, I think. Or I would like to think that every culture thinks murdering is a bad thing. Um, let, let us lurk secretly for the innocent, innocent without cause. You know, that's... There are, there are times for peace, and there are times for war. As talked about, you know, there are seasons for everything in Ecclesiastes. But when you are lurking and waiting to set a trap for the innocent that do not have cause, civilians, for example... That's the kind of thing that is just not wise, because guess what? You'll find in the rest of the Bible that God has his eyes set on those who are poor and those who are oppressed. And so if you're here, poor and oppressed, I will encourage you, pray to God, ask him to reveal himself to you. And I think God will, because he cares for those. On the flip side, you know, it's talked about that the, it's harder for the rich to uh, enter into heaven than it is for the camel to go through the idol of the eye of the needle. Uh, and that's referring to the a specific gate that humans would walk through, where separately, that's like human height from camels that were, you know, much taller. The camel still didn't like going through. Uh, human-sized doors. They were like, you know, and it was very difficult because it would take multiple people to pull them through and stuff. But anyways, for those of you who are rich and content with your lives, 
you know, uh, and I was definitely one of those during my testimony growing up because I was content with video games. I was content going into college. I encourage you that when you start surrendering things and when you start growing in character, the things of this world start fading away and you realize you never really wanted those things of the world in the first place. And you start realizing that the glory of God and all the rewards he can give you are so much greater than what this earth can give. Moving right along, we shall find all or all kinds of precious possession. Oh, almost skipped over this. So, let us fall them alive like Sheol. Sheol is referring some people think it's referring to hell you know and if you're a simple person you can believe that the people that spend way too much in scripture uh not wait i guess there's never too much in scripture but the people in you know academia they tend to lean towards sheol being this holding place in the center of the earth waiting for demons and people to be judged uh, for their good and bad deeds. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Feel free to do your own research. I would like to do more research myself before I really give a for sure answer on that. But it's it's really cool. Either way, you don't want to be waiting down in Sheol with the demons, um, you know, for Judgment Day, uh, if you can. And while, like those who go down to the pits, uh, pretty self-explanatory, we shall find all kinds of precious possessions and we shall fill our houses with spoil. Pretty self-explanatory. Cast in your lot among us and let us all have one purse. This is a big one. You don't know how many stories I've heard of where apartment mates will get together and say, let's like pool all our money together and all our income into the same checking account. And that way we, we can make bigger purchases and have a car and... You know, we won't have to worry about low funds. And what ends up happening is one of them takes advantage of all the rest, and there's all this infighting and stuff like that. Early on, when the internet was first developed, you know, a lot of the times they would try to sell an internet to a neighborhood because the cost is in building the central node to a neighborhood, not in the individual houses. But apparently, because everyone would come online at the same time, and everyone was frustrated that they didn't get the full bandwidth they were paying for for their neighborhood, because everyone else was using it at the same time, internet providers actually had to switch to a business model where they uh, charge people on a household-by-household -household basis. And even then, I've heard of cases where people will, you know, like, living in the same house will have separate internet providers for, like, multi-home, multi-family homes and stuff like that. So, just want to share with you, it's not a wise thing, generally speaking, to pool your money, the, the money that you've earned with those around you, even though it may sound good. If you want all of your money to, if you want to work together toward a common cause, make a Kickstarter. Contribute what you're willing to contribute. But don't put, give access to your bank account to other people. Don't, you know, make a centralized pool that someone could just take from, you know. Anyways, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. Pretty self-explanatory. For their feet turn, run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Surely, in vain, the net is spread in sight of any bird. But they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So we are going to find that, you know, people who are willing to shed innocent blood, who are willing to pool together their resources... They're going to be the ones that, that, that initiate that also then run to evil. You don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be some type of evil, some type of injustice. And that makes, you know, it makes haze to shed blood. Even though in America there's a fewer and fewer people that murder, I sometimes expand that shed 
blood to drain the finances from someone so they cannot survive on their own. I've, you know, that's happened pretty, like, not regularly in my past, but I've, there have been cases. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Those with discernment, those of you who listen to the words of these proverbs and digest them multiple times, will start to have discernment to not fall into the mistakes of common, simple men. And for those people, it will be in the sight of and plain to them what's going on. And, you know, they'll walk away. For the, the wise will walk away from these evil schemes. And what's crazy to think about is, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. Oftentimes, their plans will end up falling back on them, where they end up spending the rest of their lives running from these people wanting their money back. Running from people that who are vengeful of those who have been murdered and they and running from the police having to watch every step sleepless nights and then end up you know getting judged and even if they escape justice on this earth if they don't ask for god's forgiveness in this lifetime they will be paying for in hell in the next so yeah Continuing on, so are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses of the openings of the gate in the city. She speaks her words. So you'll start noticing here that wisdom starts being personified as... A, a woman that's calling out in the streets, calling out in the gates for you to listen. And as you live your life every day, you'll have the opportunity to reflect, to think about the things uh, that have occurred to you, to think about what you could have done better, what other people could have done better, how you could have lived better. Um, and so when you Reflect when you compare what you're doing in your life to these parables in Proverbs or into the uh, Christian life in the New Testament, you'll start to realize how to live in a way that is wiser, and you'll start discerning more, and you'll start making less mistakes, and you'll start making uh, having to pay for those mistakes less, being able to retain your wealth, and so on and so forth. So uh yeah there's just a lot of cool stuff to think about when you do that every time that you don't end up reflecting in one sense some will say you're listening to the personification of folly the personification of you know uh scorners the personification of the simple so Continuing on, because I got like a minute per section at this point. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in the scorner, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you, because I have called you. Or sorry, because I have called and you refuse. I, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded at the opening of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. Be and I'll continue because it's one thought. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity, and I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm, and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and English come uh, upon you. So yeah. Uh, it's really cool to see all of this. I'm sorry for all the popping noises on my microphone. I'm realizing that's what's happening, and I take good big breaths, but thank you for your patience. Uh, what What's interesting about this is this is where she talks about, she speaks at the gates, and when we're referring to the gates of Israel, that's where the market, a lot of... Uh, political endeavors would be handled, contracts would be signed with witnesses from the elders of the city, and a lot of market markets would be near the gates, because that's where people came in and out, and they wanted to want to sell their wares where people are traveling. 
And so, especially in when it comes to business, when you keep your eyes open, that's when you learn so much um, when it comes to wisdom. But you'll also learn in scripture and when you, when, in the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And so I encourage you all to uh, start realizing that you can have a personal relationship with God. And when I say fear of the Lord, it's more of an awe of who God is because he is so great above us. Like, in respect, kind of like a, the fear, respect, awe you have for a father who's good. Um, it's kind of sad to think about how, in the end, when Judgment Day comes, it will be obvious those who did not listen to wisdom, who will end up listening to follow folly and scorners in the symbol. And that's what I'm going to talk about pretty soon here. Uh, you'll notice that there's going to be three groups of losers throughout Proverbs. There's going to be the scorners, there's going to be the fools, and there's going to be the simple. Simply put, the scorners are the ones who end up just, they mock they think they know at all. And so the greatest barrier to truth is thinking you already have it. The fool is dense, sluggish, and, you know, I like to say the word stubborn. Doesn't listen to advice, doesn't listen to instruction, doesn't listen to reproof is the fancy term in the Bible. And because of that, he will not learn and therefore will um, also fall away. Lastly, the simple is just those who keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. And there's actually different calls to the simple, the scorner, and the fool throughout Proverbs, but we'll be finding out in the month, weeks to come. So, yeah. So we already went through how it's going to be sad, how those um, who don't listen to Lady Wisdom and end up listening to Folly, Simple, and, and, scorner, and the and Scorning uh, end up being, it'll be obvious to the wise of why they didn't end up in, in better places, but we'll continue on with verse 28. Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despise my every rebuke. So I find that the, uh, the few friends who I found ended up falling into folly or into scornfulness, um, they ended up... How do I describe it? They would ask for wisdom when they started realizing that their friends were walking away. When they started realizing they were going to make it when ending college. When they started realizing they couldn't land a career job. And that was a little too late in that microcosm of college because they were usually graduating. They usually didn't have the time to ingest the new stuff. Some of them, there was like one or two, you know, that became humble enough to realize the world's not about me. And they started learning. And so there is still opportunity. There is still hope for people. But for some, they become so desperate for just a way out, just money, just give me another thousand dollars to make the next month rent. That they, they, oh, tell me what the wisdom is so I can do it. But at this point, they're, they are lacking because they've dug themselves into a ditch, because they not, will not humiliate themselves and learn from their mistakes, because they're just trying to survive from day to day. They're going to end up, you know, uh, not being able to find wisdom, not being able to apply it to their life. So please, when you find yourself desperate, you know, Start realizing that there is a God outside of you, that you can pray to him, and that you can start learning wise principles long-term that will start applying in the short term. Does that make sense? I don't know. I Hopefully that helps. But Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way, and be filled to the full with their own fancies, for the turning away of the simple will slay them. 
and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. So you can already see, here's another uh, person in verse 32, the simple. But yeah, what ends up happening is they eat the fruit of what they sowed, you know. Um, earlier today, uh, during the record service, someone talked about how every person, what they sow, they'll end up reaping. And that's a very biblical verse. Yeah. So, whoever listens to wisdom... Lady Wisdom, which some scholars think is another way of talking about Jesus, will end up, uh, you know, dwelling safely and will be secure without fear of evil. And that's something I want, you know. So, I hope that's something you all want. If you want to be, to dwell safely, be secure without fear of evil, I beg you, ask Jesus into your life if you haven't already. And if you have, start spending more time with him. Because when you finally sit down to spend time with him in his word and worship and prayer, that's when you'll start seeing how real God can become in your life. And how not only he will be real for you in that you'll have spend eternity with him, but he'll be real in the sense that you'll dwell safely, be secure, and without fear of evil. I'll go ahead and close this in prayer. Um, if you want prayer for anything, I will encourage you to approach Mr. Pete or Send the One or even Phantom Ethos or Fallen Star or even Chat for Green. I guess all the people <laughs> left on my left over there. Um, I'll be over at those three trees right there to answer any questions that you have. Um, what you know, more on a one-to-one group basis and. Uh, also willing to pray with you as well. Let's bow our hearts to close the service. Dear God, thank you so much for all that you are. Thank you for this opportunity to walk through Proverbs together. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I pray that your words, God, would speak to all the hearts here and that they would be able to meditate on at least one verse here, um, but maybe more, that that would apply to their own lives. And we pray, God, that you and you alone would reveal yourself to each and every one of them in a greater capacity, and that you would explain the scriptures to them, and that they would grow in wisdom as we all, all continue to study Proverbs together. Yeah. In your powerful, precious name, Jesus Christ, God the Father, and Holy Spirit, amen.